Listener Production. I'm automotive commentator and journalist Greg Rust, and this is Rusty's Garage. For this episode, I'm on the Gold Coast in a cool garage. It's not mine, but I wish it was. I'm sitting with my guest, Charlie Schwerkolt, supercars team owner, successful business owner, and very proud family man. From a long line of Schwerkolts who emigrated here several generations ago now and have done well through sheer hard work. Charlie hasn't been afraid to roll the dice a bit. Actually, the more correct term would be to take a calculated punt, and it's paid off. More on that later. In this chat, you'll learn about his background and the incredible job he's done expanding their forklift business, which was started well before his move into motorsport. These days, you know him from Team 18, currently running Gen 3 Camaros for Mark Winterbottom and Scott Pye. But David Reynolds is going to join them next year, as we have recently learned. For a time, he was involved with Dick Johnson Racing over a decade ago when James Courtney won the title. Charlie doesn't go deep into it, but sadly his friendship with DJ is no longer and so far, time hasn't been able to heal it. Keep in mind when we get to that subject that Dick or the Johnson family aren't a part of this convo and they may have a different view of things. Form your own opinion and as I always try and do, take a balanced approach. Motorsport is a tough business and it happens sometimes. This, after all, is Charlie's story and it's more wide-reaching than just motorsport. There will be takeaways here for those of you with small businesses and wait till we get to the cars. There are some beauties here. Oh, and he's been boating with a former US president. That's a great story. Ever since I've known Charlie, he has always, always greeted me with this beaming smile, and today is no different. He has this zest for life and a work ethic I truly admire. In the midst of his busy schedule and a phone that rings its head off, we have somehow found a window for an overdue podcast convo. I hope you enjoy being part of it. It is fantastic to catch up with you. I want to get to some of the cool cars we are sitting around a little bit later in the in the chat. Can we take people um, on a little bit of a journey uh, of your story pre-racing? I want to talk the Schwerkolt family, if I, I can. You have German origins that, that date back, um, I think the family emigrated here in kind of almost the mid-1800s didn't they? Yeah, correct. Yeah, thanks, Rusty. Great to be uh, chatting today. Really, really exciting to do this uh, little piece with 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 us together. Um, yeah, the Schwerkot name's a German name and we go way, way back into the, uh, the uh, I think we came out to Australia in the, in the 1850s and uh, immigrants from Prussia was then near, which is near Berlin and uh, came out to Australia to do some farming and leave, uh, live a better life. And, and I think my uh, great Great grandfather August Schwerkont just got married and then hopped in a boat called the Emmy Lou, I think that was its name, or out something of Hamburg, like that. I think wasn't it the Hamburg? That's it, port? Hamburg, yeah. and then and then sailed out to Australia, and and it's quite incredible. Ten percent of the the people died of of scurvy or one of those diseases then, and uh, anyway they survived and and they uh, and they went to Melbourne and. Uh, and in Northcote and started a little farm there and thinking Northcote's right in the centre of Melbourne now and they had a farm there of a couple of acres. The family are an industrious lot, aren't they, <laughs> mate? When you, when you look back over history, you've all had this, uh, this, this immense work ethic. So Orchard Produce, you've, you've alluded to there a moment ago, I think, I think road materials, charcoal was some of the early kind of work? Yeah, that's right. So so after Northcote, they wanted more land. And uh, so they ventured way out into Mitcham Nunawading area, and uh, which is still right in the centre of Melbourne today. And uh, and they, I think they ended up with about 150 acres in total, which was a big, you know, property then mm. uh, back in those days. And as you said, mined, uh, did some quarrying and all that sort of stuff. And then uh, eventually uh, looking for something extra to do, 
uh, got into empty bottle collecting and started a business called uh, Schwerkop Bottle Yards. Mm, which is, I think, if I'm right, the early origins, perhaps, of the term bottle-o. It, it, was, it was about people leaving their bottles outside and, and being collected and things like that, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. Um, back in the day, there's only one. There's only really two ways of getting rid of your beer bottles and mm-hmm. drinkers, and and you could either uh, leave them in your backyard and mm-hmm. you collect the amount like twenty dozen, twenty four dozen, or you take them to a scout hall. So that's how it all started, and 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 collecting these bottles started a great little business, and then then they got into bottle washing, mm-hmm. washing the bottles, and then selling them back to the wineries and the breweries, and this all started even before Carlton United Brewery was even born. It was yeah. you know there was Richmond Brewery, Carlton Brewery, Abbotsford, and all these breweries, and and uh, started all that and collecting bottles, and you know Dad had well my grandfather's had about sixty odd horses. Going around the streets of Melbourne, Paran, that's where the, it was based in the end after Mitcham and Underwarding area, they mm-hmm. moved to Paran and, and started that whole thing there and uh, became really successful there. Yeah, councils kind of hustled in on the business, basically, didn't they? <laughs> and you, you, it might have been your grandfather, I can't remember, or you, perhaps your great-grandfather, grandfather, I want to say, had a, uh, a, a kind of light bulb moment or was it your dad that had the light bulb moment? It was actually the, dad. dad. So right? my, my grandfather... Uh, was born at Schwerkow Cottage. His name was Charles, mm. and uh, I'm the father. Uh, he's also Charles. Uh, Dad worked hard since he was about 15 years old, and and collected the bottles, worked the bottle yards really, really hard. And it's 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 a hard business. It's really hard. Bottle mm. O's, scrap metal, uh, a bit of theft, bit of dodgy <laughs> stuff going on <laughs> everywhere, and and uh, it, it's a hard game. And uh, and you're talking senses. You know, I remember when I was a kid starting. We'd pay eight cents a dozen. That's all you'd pay, and you'd these people would collect twenty four dozen bottles, and you get a dollar ninety two, which is quite incredible. But mm. anyway, dad dad worked it hard, and I think in nineteen seventy three, the councils changed the way they collected bottles. You could put your bottles out on the nature strip for the garbos to get them. Mm-hmm. So that sort of ruined the bottle yard business to a degree, and and uh, entered recycling companies like Vizzy and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And then dad thought. Bloody hell! What am I going to do? And being inventive in in in, uh, you know, tried to work out what he's going to do. And uh, he had three forklifts in the bottle yard, and and he thought, okay, well, I'll loan them out, rent them out, try and sell them. So uh, he ended up renting them out in in our street in Mount Waverley after we moved there, and and uh, he rented them out, and I thought this is not a bad little business. So he started a company called Waverley Forklifts back in 1973, and uh, before you know it. Um, I joined in 1976 and there was 12 forklifts and uh, it's quite incredible how it all started. 50th anniversary year. That's amazing. And what it's become from those very humble beginnings is massive. True national representation in Australia. It's huge, isn't it? Oh, it's massive. It's a massive business now. Give people a snapshot, just just in a, in a basic way if you can. Yeah, look, so Waverley's grown to be... Uh, a truly independent, the largest independent forklift company in Australia. It's It's got a branch, as you said, in every state in Australia. It's running way over 5,500 forklifts in its rental fleet now. It's um, Toyota's biggest customer in Australia. It's 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 a fantastic business. Mm. It's like any business had its ups and downs and recessions and all that sort of stuff, but we've soldiered on. I've been there 45 years and I I honestly still love going there every day. I've got a great team of people and, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a truly fantastic business. And uh, so, yeah, it's going well. We'll touch more on a couple of other aspects of the business and things that you've done over time through this conversation. I love the fact that you brought up the child is a reoccurring name in the family. (laughs) I reckon that's important too. And it was perhaps your great, great grandmother who was a a very good historian. She has preserved a lot of the, the, the memories, the writings, the business cards, receipts, photos, and, and so on that date right back. Hasn't she? The Waverley Way is this book that has been put together to, to encompass, to celebrate these 50 years. And it's got some, some amazing things that she's kept or started the process of keeping. Yeah, look, it's, it's actually my auntie, Is it uh, your dad's auntie? sister. Sorry. Okay. 
uh, Auntie Rosie O'Caller, and um, she's on the White Horse Historical Society, and Schwerko Cottage, our, our, our old cottage that the family had uh, from the 1850s is still going and it's open to the public. So she's sort of in charge of that area and the, the artefacts, the whole thing, the history. Amazing. And it's one of the oldest buildings still standing in Melbourne and it, it's quite incredible history. And to have all that documentation and history, is, it, it's really incredible. And uh, it's great to go up there. I don't go off and up there much, but it's great to see that cottage, you know, still standing, you know, nearly 150 odd Years ago, you restored an old buggy, I think, too, or had one restored, didn't you? Yeah, we we well, it was parked in one part of the the museum. We had to move it across. So, being adaptive, go and get an old forklift and move <laughs> it across, lift it right over some fences and and put it in there. So yeah, that no, was incredible. And it's for anyone you know in Melbourne, it's it's worth going and have a look at Schwerko Cottage. It's it's a very special place. There is a transport arm to the business too, WFL Transport, and it links it kind of altogether forklift transport, doesn't it? Correct. So um, Waverley's um, a one-stop shop and uh, my dad started by saying, you know, when you, when you get a forklift that you want the driver to be the ambassador and and uh, deliver the forklift. So the first person, do you want to, here's your new forklift, etc. So we've, we've kept on that journey with our customer-owned trucks, no subcontractors, it's all our own gear. And um, so, yeah, we're moving hundreds of forklifts a day and there's hundreds going out every day. So we, we use our own drivers. I think there's about 40-odd trucks in the fleet now. In every state in Australia, we just deliver forklifts. That's all we do and it's, it's, it's great. You talked about um, moving into the business, I think you said, around the, the mid-70s there. Am I correct in saying that it was about 1988, maybe 30, 35 years ago, that you kind of effectively took charge, if you like, Um how old were you then? How big was that step? How big were the learnings? Obviously, if you've been Im- immersed in the family business, there's there's hands-on stuff you've learned along the way. But when you find yourself in charge, it's a very different deal, Charlie, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, so, yeah, so I joined in 1976. I was 15. I um, I went to um, – I ended up going to Campbell Grammar. I didn't really want to go. I wanted to go to Jordanville Tech, hands-on type of thing. But mum said, you've got to get an education in – in uh, maths and English especially and which I thankfully, you know, I did learn that part but but I, I didn't really want to be there. I really wanted out. So I just turned 15 and the school said, no, nah, you've got to go. It's, it, you're just, this is not for you. <laughs> not, not for me at all. So I moved in and uh, I did a uh, – I was on the bottles for a year and it was really interesting going around picking up bottles and – uh, with the the bottle merchants, you know, mm-hmm. Dad's bottle mis- business at the time, and and making all that work, and then I did an apprenticeship as a uh, forklift mechanic and learning the ropes and and working with Dad, and uh, and that was good and learned the ropes. But I could see when I got my truck license, delivering these old secondhand forklifts Dad had, I thought there's got to be better. The customers are complaining about the oil leaks, the technology, even though there wasn't much much back then, but the the forklift masts were the old centre ram type and heavy steering and lots of oil leaks and and I thought there's got to be a better way and I mm. thought why don't we get some new forklifts and brand new ones invest and dad said no and uh, because at the time dad didn't borrow money that was the really old school way of doing it and mm. uh, you don't borrow money you only pay for you know what you can afford so um, we sort of came up with a plan that I that I took over the business then in 1988 and uh and uh, the first thing I did was go and buy 20 brand new forklifts. And I thought back in the time, I thought I felt like it was Alan Bond. This is massive. This is just, just huge. Big step. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but unfortunately, we had this recession that came on that we had to, to have. have. <laughs> and they all came back. So <sighs> I had to get them out. And, and interest rates then, you know, you talk about interest rates today, uh, you know, 5 and 6 and 7%. Probably talking about 17% or something. 18.5% I got to. And uh, so, yeah, it was massive. So... I had to get them out and uh, I remember we did get them out in the fruit season um, and they, they, you know, that was the beginning, getting them out. We, we were about service and mm. and uh, uh, making it work for customers and uh, so we got them out and then the journey began of slowly building and building and building and, and, uh, and where it is today. We get lots of people that run their own businesses that listen to the, the pod, um, probably can't give away all the secrets of success, <laughs> but... Is there an overarching message that you, you would say? What do you reckon one is one of the key ingredients to to why you are 
50 years later where we are. What's been one of the underpinning things, do you think, for Look, you? There's, there's quite a few things. One, the mm. passion. Mm. I seriously, after 46 years, I've been there my whole life, but as a permanent employee there, 46 years, and I have the passion and the drive to make it work. And I, it's my baby and I've mm. built it up and I love it. I love the passion that I've got for that business. And, uh, and obviously the big thing is the people. I've got some incredible people. Some have been there 30 years and, or plus, and there's some really special people. And, and we work as a team to make it, to make it the best forklift company in Australia. And of course you build a good culture. Mm. The culture is incredible. We've got, and, uh, Staff retention's good. We're in this environment, a lot of people moving around and now we've got good staff retention and, and uh, it's great. It's a great place and, uh, and uh, so, yeah, it, it's, it's a very special thing. I love that you brought up truck driving because it's not uncommon <laughs> for us to see pics of you doing that. When you go through the book, there's a really cool shot of an old Bedford with, a, I reckon, a Holden 308 yeah. V8 in it. Did yep. you drive that? Yeah, I did. Did you? Many, many years. Um, I used to, in the very early days, picking up bottles from Yarra Glen and there was driving up from Mount Waverley to Yarra Glen, had a few hills and all that and it had an old petrol six and a blue smoke and <laughs> I thought, we've got to go faster than this, so let's put a V8 in it and uh, that's what you did. But it created problems putting a V8 because vacuum brakes back in the day and you'd have to really stamp on the brake pedal to stop because they had so much go. But, but look... Um, you still drive them now, don't you? I've, I've, I've seen relatively yeah. recent pics, haven't I? Yes, yeah, yeah and I still I, look. That's your, your roots, where you grow up, and you never forget that ever. And um, I've got respect as a driver in the whole business. I'll match any of the truck drivers there and mm. have a bit of fun with them on the radio, etc. But um, that's how you grew up, and yeah, I, I love hopping in a truck now and then. It's it's good fun, and and uh, you see a lot, you learn a lot, and you you learn about your business where the 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 forklifts are going, etc. But it's a long way from the old petrol Bedford, that's for sure. And we've got some beautiful Kenworths and he knows now. And uh, yeah, it's fabulous. The array of equipment that you you supply and you work with means that you have a, a presence at, at lots of events. And I immediately think of things like the Australian Formula One Grand Prix. We've seen um, Supercross at, at Marvel Stadium, for example, Spring Carnival. And you've also done some stuff around some big name music acts, haven't you? Yeah, look, part of the business, a lot of short-term um, events. And as you as you said, the Grand Prix, that's our biggest. We've, um, when it came to Melbourne, we missed the first year. They had lots of troubles with the forklifts, but we supply all the gear for the Grand Prix and, and it's, it's a special event. It, mm -hmm. it creates work from the end of January right through to May type it's of thing. Setting up and dismantling, basically, aren't Correct, you? all yeah. the concrete blocks mm -hmm. and the fencing and, and – even though the track's just under six kilometres, um, there's fencing blocks on both sides of the track. So there's about 12 kilometres of blocks and debris fencing and all that sort of stuff. And then all the pit lane stuff with, with our friends at Gibson Freight and do all that. And so there's about 180 bits of gear um, just at the Grand Prix doing mm. that. And then, as you said, the concerts, you know, we've got Taylor Swift coming up soon. That'll be 35, 40 machines just going for that concert in every state in Australia. Um, spring racing, that's starting now. And I, I just found out today we're de delivering our first forklifts to the, the tennis open, which doesn't start till January. And they're starting to build all the precinct there. So machines are going there. Every supercar event, there's gear goes everywhere. And uh, yeah, it's, it's great that you can be in any state in Australia. Oh, there's some of my forklifts there. And then, you know, they're, they're everywhere. The daughter of every race driver in the country that loves Taylor Swift is about to call you. Good luck with that. <laughs> well, I've been trying to get tickets for my daughter and uh, even though we do the forklifts, we still can't. She's pretty close with the tickets. She won't give any away. So I think, uh, yeah, I think we'll be missing out. Before we go to racing, because people will be uh, on the edge of their seat wanting to know more about that, can we, can we ask about moments where you've dealt with tough stuff you've talked about you know the recession we had to have and big interest rates we've had COVID recently and so on what's the what's the key in in your mind because you haven't been afraid to have a go charlie your your dad was a bit more uh on, on perhaps on the cautious side in a business sense and that that's yeah. that still serves you well but you, oh, yeah, you've been sure. you've not been afraid to have a go what's been the secret of navigating some of the the tougher moments economically or business wise oh look you got to make a, a, a decision sometimes you got to stick to that decision and and just go with it we've we've obviously had plenty of challenging times and probably the biggest challenge has been 
COVID that was very challenging in the beginning. And I'll never forget we're at the Grand Prix and, of course, I got all this gear going around and we're racing ironically at the same time. And then I sort of had a bit of a hunch what was going on because of our interaction there. And we were told that morning, hey, listen, your forklifts are going to start packing up today. And I thought, (sighs) far out. But in that next couple of weeks, we had 500 forklifts come back in in about a three to four week period. And I, I never forget going back to the, the boardroom with our staff. We've got dehires everywhere. And it was the unknown. People mm. didn't know what was going on at all. And it was a bit scary then. That was probably the scariest. You could navigate through those early days. There was not as much to lose. And I had a lot to lose if when you had 500 forklifts come back and potentially more. But obviously those tough times, opportunity also... For those who are brave, I'm, I'm, I'm not scared to take a risk. And uh, we could see it starting to turn in, that was May 20, I think, no, March 2020 when it all started. But we could see it starting to turn slow right down in, in about August. And I'm thinking, I think there's going to be a shortage of machines. It just they're going everywhere in the world and why don't we buy a massive amount of machines. So it came up with a new plan. Yes, it was a big risk and we bought a lot of machines off Toyota and and then they started going out and then got more machines. And as you know, in, in some of the, the world is stock is king Yes, and we had the stock. And so we grew the business dramatically um, in 21 and 22 of just servicing uh, all our customers that have grown with us. And uh, it's it's been good, but just never give up. From one legendary team boss to another, strap in and maybe get a beer. Drink responsibly please otherwise Rusty will get me in trouble. Now, imagine managing two of the most competitive drivers on the planet, Craig Lowndes and Mark Scaife. Over to Jeff Gregg to tell us all about it. Those two blokes were the, were a handful, but boy, did did they lift the team. I mean, geez, I there wouldn't have been a day gone by when, when those two were in the workshop that that there was not a positive come out of any negative. So, but absolutely as a team manager, that's when the hair started receding. <laughs> and um, and one beer a night turned into a couple. Catch the legendary former Holden Racing team boss, Jeff Gregg, in the garage library. People would be interested to know about, I mean, we're surrounded by some very cool cars. You're, you're a car person, there are... Um, in your office, you have some special Marcus Ambrose helmets. There's all kinds of memorabilia that, that surrounds us here. So the place oozes it. Did you race carts when you were younger and how did you go? <laughs> <laughs> um, I did race carts when I, and I loved it. And I still, mm. um, I still, when the, when we do a, a corporate function with some of our sponsors and I, I'll still go and have a go and getting a little bit rusty at the moment, but you know, I'll always, the two drivers would be one and two, and then I'd probably always come third. But mm. uh, love my karting, and I started Oakley, Oakley Car Club with a mate of mine, Mark. Famous uh, Mark Oscar Grange. Piastri was that's I think that's yeah, home yeah, no, for him. Yeah, no, I was probably a little bit earlier. No, than I know that. that, but that's that's what I'm you know telling people yeah. that's where he's from. And then so. I remember going. I came fifth in a, an Australian title at Brooklyn, and it was the last year of Brooklyn. So I don't know when that was. It was. 80s or something Mm -hmm. Uh, that was the last before Todd Road and that was the Melbourne's track then and tell me about the cart what class what what class I was club and light Mm -hmm. so yes just uh the MR 100 inch you'll remember now and it's probably some bits and pieces floating around but um loved it and Mm. I'd you know every Sunday be you know somewhere around Victoria doing that and throw the cart in the back of the truck and it was good fun and I've always had that interest in car racing I wanted to go speedway I wanted to do other things but look work forklifts really got in the way and had a love for building a beautiful business, which I, I did. But that interest in cars and car racing has been there. And as a kid, Dad take me to Bathurst all the time. And I remember in the 60s and 70s going up there and Bill Brown, there's a photo of me with, with Bill Brown rolling that HO across Falcon the top. Wow. right across the top. And yeah. I'm standing next to it and it's on this little fence there and it's incredible. And going to Sandown as a kid because um, we lived only about four or five k's from Sandown and mm. – and the old pits there and see Alan Moffat, of course, and Bond and and all my heroes there and it, it was special times. And so, yes, I've watched it all the time and loved it. I, I really have. So what you've now ended up doing as a, as a team owner and so on, was the early genesis for, let's call it a, a Waverley forklift involvement or, or a, a 
more of a, a presence, if you like, even if you weren't racing in, in a karting sense like you were. There is a pick in the book. I think it's Mark Walker and he's got a an HQ Holden. It's on, on a flatbed of, oh, yeah. of yours. I mean, is that some of the early stuff where you were supporting people perhaps? And so For on? sure. Yeah, yeah. look, um, we were definitely – I'm – I saw a, a front guard the other day of Owen Kelly and supporting Owen Kelly for something and a few others and all that sort of stuff. And Excellent. I enjoy, you know, people getting success out of it. And mm. uh, so, yeah, wherever I can help, I, I did. And and uh, so, yeah, there's always been an involvement, a small one, all the way through to the DJR days. Wow. So is that the first kind of big step to go and play or did you do something else in, in a racing involvement sense, or and how did how did the the kind of conversation come about? Obviously, you two at that stage knew each other pretty well. How did how did you get involved, and when did it kick off? Two thousand eight. So, no, um, well, look, it, it actually started in two thousand and one. I okay. think it was. Um, I was going to the the touring car races where you were commentating there, probably mm. way back then. I'm not sure. Four grey hair, Charlie. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> um, and. Uh, with a bunch of mates, we'd go to the races. We'd go to Bathurst and hop on a light plane somewhere and, and tour around Australia. And and it, it was special doing those with fun mm. fun things and all that sort of stuff. But obviously I had a serious thing of looking around. And anyway, uh, this one particular car, a time I went up with a friend, Gary, and we had a couple of seats on the way back from Winton. So Gary said, look, I know Dick Johnson and do you mind if, you know, he'll come back on the plane? So I think it was... Dick and John Bow that came back. I'm not sure, mm-hmm. um, but they came back on the plane. And uh, Dick, being Dick, he he's. I sat next to him and he said, "So what do you do?" I've never met Dick in my life, and I said, "Look, I, I rent forklifts out, and sell and rent forklifts out." And straight away he said, "I need a new forklift. Why don't we hook up?" And and uh, I reckon he's done his homework, but <laughs> why don't we hook up and uh, see uh, see if we can do some sort of a deal? So I think it was a couple of weeks later. This is an O one. I went up to to his his workshop and and he gave me a, a ride with him and a, a door for the car which I've still got somewhere and a few other bits and pieces and I think I put my name on Waverley forklifts on the car back then Excellent. and and uh, we struck a friendship mm. and uh, so that was oh one and then sort of it started really oh two oh three and sort of being involved with the team and then you know. Just on a friendly, not rushing in or out, absolutely not doing much at all. But uh, and then ended up sort of sponsoring the team a little bit in 04, 05, mm. just on a on a very small way and helping where I could, helping a mate. And it would ultimately get to a point where you were kind of heavily involved and in a in a hands on way with the team, weren't you? In, 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 you yeah, uh, where I could help, mm. I I I guess. It was a learning thing if I, if I, you know, to be honest, you know, the car racing thing, mm. the whole thing. The was it your commercial paddock. strength? What was it that you were bringing to the table? You were yeah, yeah, just yeah. the commercial side. Mm. Yeah, mm. the commercial side and, and just another sounding board. He had, mm. a, he had David Siegel looking after the drivers and doing PR and all mm. that sort of stuff there. And, and uh, at the time, Steve Chalker was running it. And, and then uh, I was just another sounding board mm. as a mate, really. And we used to go boating together and doing quite a few things like that and, mm. And uh, so it was good. I enjoyed those early days for sure. It was the, good. The zenith, the highlight, of course, is the title, 2010, mm. James Courtney. You, to this day, still have a, a good connection with Adrian Burgess. I think Adrian, when he came out from um, the UK with, with family, you were big on sort of uh, helping them settle in here and, and um, things like that. I mean, that year was fairy tale in, in many ways and it had its challenges, didn't it? Yeah, look, it was tumultuous in the end, which is mm. a real shame. But uh, going back to Adrian, you know, I never forget. It was at Wanneroo. It was at Wanneroo. I think it was '06. Yeah, it was Wanneroo '06. And Dick came to me. I'm I'm looking for a new team manager, and there was two that he was looking at. I think that one was Jeff Greg, and one mm-hmm. was Adrian Burgess. That he flew out from England, and uh, Adrian got the gig, which is which is good, and built up a relationship with Adrian and. And uh, as you said, won the championship in the end. But 07 came along and then uh, Dick wanted to – Dick got into strife, as you know, mm. in, in, in a big way financially. And uh, I think, um, you know, at the end of 07, he basically sold the team to John Marshall mm-hmm. and uh, from No Limit Group. Mm-hmm. And uh, Marcus was his son, of course. And then uh, – but unfortunately – it all fell over in January. I'm not sure the reason why. And then Dick sort of 
can you help me out? Mm. And uh, so I ended up buying 50% of the team in the beginning of 08 and set about building the team um, back up again from from where it was. Mm. It, it was in a bit of a financial mess. Mm. The, the tough part was because you, you I mean you had Will Davison, James Courtney came in and and so on, naturally CVJs around. So they're, they're, the pros were trying to, you know, win the title and move forward a certain way and, and it it was tough in a friendship sense for you guys, mate, in the end, wasn't it? I mean, you didn't – did you really even get to celebrate that 2010 title? No, not really, no. Unfortunately, it was, it was tough and mm. and uh, um, we're pulling at each other. One's going the family way and mm. and the other's the business model and one's trying to win and, and it was all over the joint and, and, and then, you know – I'm buying Dick out. He's buying me out. The whole thing, and then Nathan Tinkler's involved mm. to, to he's going to rescue the, the the partnership type mm. of thing, and that never happened. And so it was a bit messy. So unfortunately, we we split the team up after the championship winning uh, period. Then and yeah, no, it, it was a very very tough time. Unfortunately, no, I I didn't celebrate at all really, and. Uh, I think I've had a few quiet drinks with James Courtney now and then over yeah. the, the journey or Adrian and it, it was a bit of a sad way to end it. But yeah. I know I was at the helm of the wheel doing all that and, yeah, I can still help my head high of what we achieved back then yeah. and uh, uh, to win that championship is still quite incredible. You kept the car. That's in reception, isn't it? For yeah, still got the car, which is great. It's a beautiful car. It's fully restored and, uh, yeah, I love it. And uh, yeah. Have you had a steer? No, but I, I, it was funny, um, current team manager Bruin said, why don't you take this car to Goodwood? It would be just amazing to take there and do something like that. So we toyed about the idea of this year, but it was just too rushed. And, uh, but I'd certainly love to take it over there. And, but, yes, yeah, so I've got to, you know, at the end of this year, I'm, I promised myself I've got to get that car out and, and do some laps and learn how, uh, how, how good she is. Good on you. This may be a question you, you're not comfortable to answer, and I'll fully respect that if you don't want to. Has time healed wounds? Are you and Dick able to sort of chat now, or is it just a chapter that's closed and you've gone your way and he's gone his? Yeah, look, no, I don't mind answering it. No, it's unfortunately it hasn't really healed anything there. Mm. It's He he was, I guess, bitter about the whole thing and it, it just the way it went. So I'll say hi. He'll say hi and, and that's it. We move, move on. on. But the rest of everyone else, yeah, no dramas at all. You kept the wreck. You decide to embark on your own journey. When did you decide that? How big was that decision? Because you're going from having a, a an involvement, a stakeholding, a partnership, if you will, to charting your own course in supercars. Was that something you thought long and hard about? And when did you hit the go button? Yeah, it was a tough one. Um um, I'm trying to go back now and, and, uh, I, uh, so in the end, yes, Nathan Tinkle was going to buy us out and then far out, it was going to be, uh, it, it, it fell over. So we basically split the team in half and Dick took his wreck and I took mine 18 and he mm -hmm. had 17 numbers and, uh, and we, we, we split everything, split the debt, split everything. And, uh. Um, and we go down that path and, and Dick continued on by getting an investor, which was Steve Brabeck, mm -hmm. the Crimsafe, Crimsafe owner, and he'll Dick get along and move on and then I decided what I'm going to do with this wreck and the whole thing. So I leased it back to Dick for, for the period of that was part of our deal for 2011 and 2012 and I leased it back for those two years. Mm. And so I'm sort of out of the sport and... Uh, um, just watching from the sidelines, never went to a race or anything like that. And mm. a bit of a tough time, obviously, you know, on the front page of the paper, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was a bit of a tough time. How dark? Yeah, pretty dark. And, mm. uh, but I, I soldiered on, I ended up, you know, working hard in the business, obviously, um, uh, the forklift side is still going strong and mm. building and then, uh, those mental challenges you think wow could have done it different and and everything the way it all worked i went and did the kokoda trail i went and did that with a, uh, one of the guys phil young who was uh, a physio at one, uh, the team mm. and and that was challenge that was really good that was a you know you, you climb the, that mountain there and wow and you can do anything then and don't undersell that i, I um 
I'm very proud. 20 years ago, I did a trek to Everest base camp with my wife, but I've spoken to others who have done Kokoda. Um, I've not done it. And, um, you know, I think Jess Yates has done it. I want to say maybe Dylan Alcott too. I can't remember, but, but I mean, grueling, mate. I mean, you learn a lot about yourself, I would imagine. In yeah, that, you in did that. for sure. Mm. I never forget. I'm cutting 20 kilos, of training in the Narang State Forest every twice a week, three times a week with 20 kilos on my backpack. And I'm thinking, what am I doing? This is just mm. grueling. But that training, all that training going up and down with a couple of poles and everything, mm. and it was grueling. It was really, really tough. And, of course, we went there. It rained nonstop for the six days we did it, nonstop. And you're in mud up to your ankles through rivers and everything like that. But mm. um, it was nothing compared to what they did in the war and, mm. and, uh, and it was incredible. But I got back from there and I'm thinking, you know what, this is, this is a great thing to do and uh, it certainly uh, um, it's been yeah, in my memory bank forever. Excellent. So you decide to create at some point Team 18. <laughs> at, w- at what point did you go, okay, I'm, I'm going to hit the go button on this and did it involve a conversation with family? Did you? How did you sort of bring this all together? Yeah, look, um, so 2011 and 2012, I've leased the wreck out and, and I had a chance, do I sell? Do I go and do a, a customer thing? It's too hard to start your own team. Mm-hmm. Um, so I leased the wreck to to FPR, mm-hmm. the current Tickford people, and uh, I thought um, I um, uh, James Courtney was going to drive for me at that stage. Mm-hmm. He stayed... Where did he go? I can't even remember the puzzle, but um, yeah, he was going to come along board, and uh, but he didn't, and I uh, ended up getting gelled with sponsorship for 2013, 2014, mm-hmm. and a very good friend of Nigel was uh, running that, and uh, so I ended up thinking, well, the model stacks up. Mm-hmm. I get to go car racing, they do all the maintenance, the whole thing, I'll buy the car. And I thought this is a good way to go racing and uh, still involved, bring the sponsors on, look after the sponsors and had one, uh, Ben Nightingale, he was my commercial guy mm-hmm. doing He's that with, with me. Ford. Mm-hmm. He's with Ford now, yeah. yes. And uh, and so we started that way and, and off we went. And uh, and so Alex Davison uh, took the, the helm at the wheel there and uh, I think we finished about 11th in that season. We got a podium at uh, Phillip Island and and for the first year it wasn't a bad year. There, there are when you're um, in that building phase to the team eighteen that we now know today, and you you have that um, that supplier connection or that customer co- connection, mm. if you like. Um, it doesn't always mean that that the ingredients are perfectly there to do what a competitive Charlie worker wants to wants to do. So that means there are some testing times in that process until you find a structure that works for you and. Bit of that happened, didn't didn't yeah. that? Yeah. yeah, for sure. So yeah, um, commercially, it's got to be sound for me and mm. the right partners and and working with people and uh, and I've had a lot of, you know, twenty thirteen and twenty fourteen. Some of the sponsors way back then are still with us today and building and growing, and that's a, a testament to them to be on the journey with me and getting a lot out of it. And because I like to deliver, I can't go racing without all these partners. And there's some very special partners like mm. Seiko Watches have been on since 2014 and Manitou Forklifts was 2013. But, um, yeah, so I took that journey and kept going that way. Jack Perkins came on in 2014. I think – I don't think it, it, it was – it wasn't the best year. I think it was very hard, the customer model back then. Mm-hmm. I, I felt I was the – the fourth one in the chain there on the queue and uh, it was a bit of a messy year then and I thought, oh, well, 2015, I'm going to change camps from the Ford camp. Um, Adrian's running... Uh, Walkinshaw was a Holden Holden racing team. team. Yes, Holden yeah. racing team mm-hmm. then before it was then, while mm-hmm. it was called. And I thought, this is going to be good. Go in there. I brought on Lee Holdsworth. Holdsworth. Yep. That's right. And uh, away we go. Again, this customer model, uh, it's... you. you you felt like are the bits the same bits. Hmm. Why? Why do we have to let James Courtney go past? Why is this and all that sort of stuff? And I just felt, you know what? This is this is not exactly. If I'm in this, hmm. I've got to do it properly. And and uh, so I thought at the end of 2015, I think it was in New Zealand. I think it was one of the last rounds. I said to Lee, 
I I think we're going to go and do this on our own. We're going to go and start a team on their own. Mm. And boy, oh boy, did the world open. Of, of starting something from scratch mm. is really, really hard. You've got to get a team manager. You've got to get a car. You've got to get staff, the whole thing. And I, I'm not sure if I was the last person to start a team from scratch, you know. the In the current. current in the current, the yep, yeah. Yep. But, you know, the Groves have bought Kelly's and mm. – uh, Erebus bought Stones and Premier's bought Techno. So mm. I'm, I would think I'd be the last person from to scratch. start a team mm. from scratch, and mm. that was a hard gig. So we we rented a factory in Dandenong. Jeff had a lot of Jeff Greck was our team manager. Got him on board. Roland got me a second hand car. It was mm. the the I think it was um, the car that uh, the wild car that did Bathurst at the time. Chassis mm -hmm. number one or chassis number thirty and, what would that and have been a, the, an Xbox car? an Xbox yeah, car. Yeah, yep. bought that car off him because there was no cars available right at the end of of twenty fifteen. So we're away in twenty sixteen and uh, then I got a naming rights sponsor, Preston mm -hmm. High, and they're they're still good friends today. All all the naming rights are still friends today from all those years back. But uh, and then we're away. A couple of things I want to before we we sort of immerse ourselves into the, the current state of play. Firstly, it's immediately obvious, because uh, I've seen you do it, and Adrian reminded me, that the, the commercial um, management, if you will, the way you look after sponsors is, is I would think, a natural extension of what you do at Waverley. It's, it's something you're very good at. You've been able to preserve them in the, in the sort of um, the, the links that you talk about. In, in a business where... It can be brutal where people try and poach each other's sponsors. That's that's. I'm not being rough when I say that. That's a long, almost tradition. It's happened for a long, long time. How have you How have you gone about keeping your arm around them and fencing them in? And what's been key to that? Do you reckon? Looking after them really well. I, I'm I'm proud to say that as I said, the the journey that they've been with us has been really solid. Mm. Um, I think I've only lost one major sponsor to another team. And it was probably money driven. Mm -hmm. um, they were looked after very well, and you over, you know, always give more than you promise, and you mm -hmm. over deliver and um, communicate well, and and uh, you just you've they're investing a lot of money, and they want a return, and I'm I make sure that they get a return, Turn. and mm -hmm. if they don't, well, we've let's sort out the problem. What do we need, and and uh, say so, yes, we we have our sponsor summits, and we have all sorts of stuff, and once you're with Team Eighteen, it's you you should providing you're sponsoring a team yeah you'll stay there when you're in that customer arrangement that you just talked about before you got to what we really now know as as team 18 did you have a moment perhaps where you talked with colleagues maybe family and went should i really keep doing this did you contemplate not going any further no i don't think so no mm -hmm. i can't remember those days i it was very difficult when I couldn't deliver what I wanted to deliver, mm. um, being in a customer team, you only get this, you only get that, you're not allowed to do this and your merchandise is over there, not with them and all this sort of stuff and mm -hmm. I just felt I wanted to have a go at doing my own thing and prove to myself that there's a better way of doing it mm. and uh, I thought, well, I'm not a person that gives up and I'm thinking, you know what, I'll go and, I'll go and do it the right way commercially how I think it should be done and uh, and deliver to those people. And so, yeah, our colleagues especially and, and uh, yeah, we, we made it work. You are the Energizer Bunny, mate. You are this this bundle of always outgoing uh, passion and kind of positivity. Have you been that way your whole life or is that something that has just been, been learned and does motor racing – have its moments where that takes a bit away from you because that's your kind of, I feel like that's your natural quality. Mm. Yeah, no, I've got this stupid amount of energy all the time. Absolutely stupid. I'll go to work and everyone's, oh, here he comes. <laughs> Look out. And uh, it's a bit of fun and all that. I love to have fun at work and Waverley and all that sort of stuff. And some, and the same in the race team, you know, mm. I'm buzzing around everywhere and what's going on. And I, I don't micromanage people, build your people, build your staff the whole time. And so we had a lot of fun, but yeah, motor racing can kill that abyss and you can get knocked down, you get turfed off and you can have a, you know, a cruel engine failure, rare mm. engine failure on lap one at Bathurst in 2016 and I'm thinking this is good, we're looking good and lap one, never forget, mm. 
halfway up the straight. No, I think it was on the, the, the warm-up lap. The engine doesn't feel right. And then mountain straight, she's dead. And you want to deliver. And, and so, yes, I'm always energising. I'm always positive. You know, you, you've, you've got to be around positive people the whole time. And, and, and negative people don't do anything for me. I've just always positive people. That's the end of part one of my podcast with Team 18 Supercars boss Charlie Schwerkold. We are just warming up. There is a second instalment, a second edition, a part two for you, all loaded up and ready. Perfect content to enjoy during the enduro part of the supercar season. And that's when we are scheduled to release this. From splitting with DJR and working with other outfits in the pit lane to making the big commitment to go it alone. Plus some of the cool cars in his collection and a whole lot more right here on Rusty's Garage.